Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming along. Um, I'm going to sit, if that's OK, rather than um, stand for the, the time that we've got. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin um, with a story. Uh, and there's a particular reason for me choosing this story, um, apart from the fact that it is one of my favorite, which, favorites, which I hope will become clear. And the story goes that far, far, far to the west of these lands is an island. You probably know it, you'll have seen it in your dreams. It's right out on the very, very edges of the world. Stormy beaches, long sandy strands, rocky coves. You probably know the one. And they say that from the highest cliffs on the westernmost coast of that island, if you look out to sea for long enough, you can see a Tina Man, the Isle of Women. And also on the farthest westernmost, highest, rockiest cliffs on that island, sometimes, if you're very lucky, you might happen across a cave. And in that cave lives the old woman of the world. You might wonder what she does there. Well, she weaves. The old woman of the world doesn't really know how long she's been there, but it seems to her that she can't remember a time when she wasn't there, weaving. And her aim with that weaving is to make the most beautiful tapestry that the world has ever seen. And she weaves it from all kinds of different brightly coloured threads, just literally making it up as she goes along. But the other thing that she has at the bottom of that weaving is she has a fringe that are made with the spines of sea urchins and the spines of blackthorns, because the old woman of the world knows that everything beautiful always has a little sharp edge to it. She's not alone in that cave, though. Right at the back of the cave, right in the corner there, amongst the shadows so that you can hardly see him, is a big black bird. And his name is Trickster Crow. Now, nobody really knows how long Trickster Crow and the old woman have been living together, but she can't remember a time when he wasn't there. It seems that wherever the old woman of the world goes, there goes Chris Trickster Crow too. And on the other side of that cave, away from the weaving, is a big burning fire. And over that fire, is a big black pot bubbling away with all of the seeds of all of the growing and living things of all of the world bubbling away. And it's the old jo woman's job as well to tend this pot. And so every now and again, she'll get up from her weaving and she'll go across to the other side of the room and she'll stir the pot so that the bottom of the pot doesn't burn and all of the living and growing things of the world will be protected. So up she gets, off she goes, across to the other side of the room. And while she's stirring and getting lost in the most beautiful smells of all of the herbs and the spices of the world, there's a little flutter in the back corner of the cave. Trickster Crow gets down from his perch, stands in front of the weaving and thinks, oh, that's a pretty one. That's a bright shining thread. I'll have that. So he pecks at it. Very satisfying. Away it comes on the floor. There's another one. Pluck, pluck, pluck. And by the time the old woman turns away from the fire, stirring all of the living and growing things throughout the world, there's nothing left of her weaving but a pile of tangled threads on the floor. The trickster crow is back in his corner. What does the old woman of the world do then? Does she weep? Does she wail? Does she throw her hands up in horror and give up? No. She looks at the pile of threads, and there's one that catches her eye particularly beautiful shade of sea green. Picks it up. That's a beautiful thread. There's a loom. There's a warp. Off she goes again. Another thread picks it up and she starts weaving again because that's what the old woman of the world does. That's what she's for. And you know what the old woman of the world is doing with those threads? She's trying to make the most beautiful tapestry that the world has ever seen. And Trickster Crow, there at the back of the cave, he knows something that we sometimes forget. That if she ever did make the most beautiful, perfect tapestry that the world had ever seen, the world would come to an end. And so Trickster Crow keeps on pecking, as the old woman keeps on weaving, so that the world may never come to an end. Now that's a story um, that I've seen in different versions in many parts of the world. And Pretty much every old mythology has an old woman of the world in it. Okay, there's always some equivalent of an old woman, some old crone, some old hag that's fundamental to the being of the world. 
And what many people don't know is that in these islands, we also have an old woman of the world. She springs mostly from the Gaelic tradition of Scotland and the Gaelic tradition of Ireland, but she's, she's present in England too, in other forms and by other names, and in Wales um, and other Celtic lands, and her name is the Caliach. The Caliach, the old woman, that's the Gaelic word for old woman. And she is the creator and shaper of the land throughout these islands. She's forgotten now, mostly, except for those of us who know her mythology very well. But she is, um, she is um, a, prime, a, a typical characteristic of what a gentlemanly Irish folklorist from the University of Cork called traditional Irish, myth uh, sorry, traditional Irish cosmology. And I'm, I'm going to explain why I keep harping on about Ireland in a minute, but it relates to the rest of the world as well. And here's what he said. Traditional Irish cosmology consists of a universe whose outer and ultimate layer is the domain of a divine female who permeates the whole with her presence and her power. There's not a divine male in sight in those old mythologies. Okay? That's the pre-Christian mythology, but it's not very long ago. And the stories are still there. The stories about the Cayach, the place names of the Cayach, so many hills in Scotland, so many mountains in Ireland, absolutely there. And nobody seems to remember that not so very long ago this was the case. So she is imminent in the land, the Cayach. She's the one who made and shaped it. There are stories about how she um, carried um, a bunch of stones in her apron. She was a giantess, and as she was striding across the land, um, she tripped over and the um, stones fell down and became the mountains. She had a hammer that she used to, you know, to um, hollow out the valleys. Very much, um, very much the, um, the power of the land personified, very, very old. If she used to say, when I was a lass, the ocean was full of trees. So she really is associated with the, kind of like the geological ages of the world. Um, she's here in England in the form of um, a little bit less known creatures, black anise, and there are some megs um, here and around the north of England um, that are associated with mountains, and almost certainly um, vestiges of the Kayak, because it, this was pre-Celtic mythology, and so it would at some level um, have covered all of these lands. We also see giantesses like that uh, in Brittany, uh, in Malta, in Scandinavia, it was very, very common at one stage to have this concept of the land being created by a woman. When the Celts came along, um, and let's not go into um, where they came from or whether there really were such things as Celts at all, but when they came along, they carried that sense of, of the otherworldly female with them, of the divine female with them. And it was a little bit different in those days because it was a slightly more patriarchal society. But nevertheless, what you had in the Irish other world particularly, and I'm talking about Ireland, let me just get this out of the way, because it has the, the greatest collection of existing stories than any other Celtic country or any other part of the UK. So we just know more. It's not just because I live there, it's because we know more um, in Ireland. So it was very much everything, although a lot of Irish literature and mythology looks like it's hero driven. You know, you have these great heroes like Cuchulain and Finn uh, darting off through the countryside doing um, amazing things. They were always under the um, power, for want of a better word, of otherworldly women who, if they um, didn't do their job properly, would come and set them on track and tell them all of the things that they must do. Um, all of the Irish goddesses, if I can call them that, I suppose, in legend were were absolutely and firmly associated with place. They came from specific places. They were in the land, they were your tribal goddess. They couldn't be extracted from them. You didn't find them anywhere else, you only found them in that place. So you'll find, for example, there are lots of different Bridgets, not just one, it depends on which is Bridget of all kinds of different places. Very much associated with the land. And the reason for that is that their cosmology was absolutely fundamentally based on living in harmony with the land. Absolutely. We don't know very much about the, the Celtic um, practices, traditional practices and religious beliefs, because the, the, the trainings of the Druid were not written down. But the bardic information, the legends, the myths, were written down in Christian times by monks who collaborated with the bards, with the poets. And so we have a very good idea of what their worldview was, even if we don't know, you know what the specific teachings were. And it is very clear throughout Irish mythology and to the extent that it exists in Scotland that they are, they are operating in a, land, in, in a place where your relationship with the land was absolutely fundamental to your own well-being, to the well-being of the cosmos. 
And there is a quality of the goddess of the land, which is called sovereignty, which I wrote about um, in If Women Rose Rooted, um, for those of you who've read it, which is um, very much about this business of, of the, the, um, the power of the land in influence, the power of the other world and the power of the land in influencing human affairs. So much so that right up into the 16th century in Scotland, there was a ceremonial marriage between the king and the land, between the king and the female qual qualities of the land, which, um, uh, w which was intended to represent um, you know, the, the, the harmony and the balance that, that people must always respect the land, must never take more than their fair share, and all of these kinds <coughs> of things. Now, we tend to think of that as ingrained in Native American mythology and the mythologies of other indigenous people, don't we? But it's absolutely <coughs> there, fundamental, clear for everyone to see in the old stories from these lands. So that's the first thing. Um, that I wanted to say. That is why I think, the main reason why I think that our native mythologies are really very important for, for us to understand, because we don't have to go looking elsewhere for that kind of wisdom of the land. It's absolutely there in our own stories, and I think it would be really important for us to, to, to relearn them. When the relationship between people and the land broke down, when the king didn't respect the land in that old mythology, a wasteland happens. Okay, it's a very, very clear um, result of that old bargain, that old marriage between the people and the land. Always a wasteland happens, there are always consequences. And there are some very, very powerful stories, not least amongst the Grail mythology, the mythology of the Holy Grail, which tell us about that in various different forms. So this is our, um, our dreaming, I suppose, if I can steal an Australian um, Aboriginal phrase. This is. These are the stories that are held in the land that we walk on today. These are the stories that are under our feet and that are available to us. And one of the things that I believe very strongly, um, coming from my training um, in certain areas of psychology, which I'll come to in a moment, is that these stories, we, we didn't make them up. Um, not everything comes out of our heads. We think it does often. But I don't believe that they do. And um, there was a French philosopher called Henri Corbin, who was a student of ancient Islamic um, uh, philosophy, uh, particularly Sufism. <coughs> and he talked a lot about the different worlds. The, the ancient Sufis believed that there were different worlds kind of layered on top of each other, if I can put it very simplistically. One of these worlds which existed, he said, between the world of the intellect and the physical world was called the mundus imaginalis. I've been writing about this for a good few years now, so I'm sorry if it's a repeating of something that you'll already have heard me say or talk about. And this is literally the, imagi the imaginal world. This is the place where the stories live, where the myths live, where the archetypal characters that inhabit those myths live, so the old woman of the world you know, is an archetype. She, she's our form from that archetype is the Kayak. In other places, she might be spider woman or whatever. But the, the archetypes live, have an existence of their own in the Mundus Imaginalis and kind of are available to us. Now, I see that um, concept of the Mundus Imaginalis, the imaginal world, is not very dissimilar to the Celtic other world. But we're not going to go into that because that would be a whole other talk. Um, the Mundus Imaginalis, these images, why I, why I say this and why I think it's so important is that they connect us with the land. They're kind of a bridge in the same way as that, that world, as conceived of in the Sufi philosophy, is a bridge between the intellect and the physical world. So it is a way of <coughs> connecting us back to the land. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this in a minute so that you'll understand what I'm talking about. So. I believe very strongly that myth and story are the connective tissue um, that, that helps us belong again to the places we inhabit. And it seems to me so often today um, that we are facing um, an epidemic of unbelonging, um, of alienation, where people find it very, very difficult to really feel a sense of proper embodied belonging to the places where their feet are actually plonked as opposed to some imaginary place in their heads where they'd like to live or hope one day to live or wish they lived or is in a book or whatever. And 
one of the reasons why I write constantly about myth and stories of the land is I really do believe that they're a very, very strong bridge. If we can capture our own imaginations um, by using myth and story, then we can find a way of belonging to the land. The, <coughs> the point, though, that's important is that this native mythology um, that we have, <coughs> all of the old stories, some of which I wrote about in If Women Rose Rooted, the stories of the Kayach, they are <coughs> there and they're old, okay, and they were, they're several, there's only the Kayach probably that has stories of several thousand years old, as far as we can tell. And so the question often becomes, well, what relevance do they have today? You know, particularly the stories um, in, um, from out of the Celtic um, period are very clearly, although they, are, they have values which I think are very relevant to us today, this idea that we must live in harmony and balance with, with the land, they portray a society where clearly the ways of life were different, um, the values sometimes were quite different, the morals were quite different there, um, preoccupations were quite different. So do these stories really have any relevance to us now, um, apart from the fact that, um, that they do portray these wonderful values of living in balance and harmony with the land? And, more to the point, what if I live in a place where, where the Kaliach isn't? Because she is very much associated with particular places. So what happens then? What if you can't find these old archetypes in the place where you dwell. What if you live in the middle of London, where I'm fairly sure the Kaliak probably never visited? Although, you know, back in ages past, there would have been an old woman of the world here too. It's just that we don't know who it is. And this became something that was very interesting to me quite recently. Um, in if Women Rose Rooted, I, I wrote a lot about um, my time on the Isle of Lewis in the um, Western Isles, the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, and I spent four years there um, on a very remote croft right <coughs> on the southwestern tip uh, where you could see St Kilda from um, our back window and um, where there, were n there was, I think I can safely say, there was nobody probably within about four hours travelling that I could really talk to about anything that mattered to me. Um, people go to the ends of the world for all kinds of reasons, you know, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad and sometimes you, you find people there and wonder what they're doing there, I'm sure they think exactly the same of you, but it's surprisingly difficult sometimes in these fragmented communities to, to, to make connections with people. And so um, I was thrown on a, uh, on a craft uh, with a husband who, who at the time was very preoccupied with other things and um, had nobody really to talk to and so my, my greatest friendship was with the land around me. Now that was a landscape that was steeped in mythology of the Cailleach. And in Scotland, um, the Cailleach has an alter ego, Bride, who is the equivalent really of the old Irish um, goddess Bridget. And Bride is either her alter ego or her sister, depending on the version of the story. The story is that the Cailleach um, kind of like presides over the dark winter half of the year, and Bride, her more fertile sister, presides over the summer half of the year. And there are all kinds of stories about you know, them battling for supremacy at, um, at the times where the seasons change. And it was very real um, to me because a lot of the place names around there had um, uh, residues of that old mythology. And um, the front of our house looked out onto a mountain range which was very like the reclining figure of a woman. Now you see these all the time in Scotland. Um, you know, it's just the shape of a woman lying in the landscape and often they have names associated with the Kayak, like the big one at Callanish Stones, uh, which in English is the Sleeping Beauty, but in um, Gaelic is Kayak and Amanchak, uh, which is the old woman of the moors. Um, so, so she was there in front of me, dominated the village, dominated the entire landscape, and when you've got nobody else to talk to, sometimes you talk to mythical figures. And so that was a very, very important time for me, uh, and I won't go on um, about all of the different ways in which I kind of like steeped myself in the mythology of the Kayak and, uh, and all of the rest of it, because that's a whole story in itself too. But um, when I moved to Donegal, um, I very much wanted to go back to Ireland. It was time to leave. And Ireland also is steeped in stories of the Kayak, probably more so than Scotland, in slightly different ways. She's not quite as fierce there, she's a bit gentler. Um, but in Donegal, uh, to the place that we moved, there were absolutely no residues at all of the Kayak in that particular place. 
So I had gone from a place which was steeped in her legend, where there were place names named after her, to a place where I couldn't find her at all. There were no place names, there were no old stories about the Kayich. It's quite a new place, Donegal, in lots of ways. It's way, way out west, and it was only inhabited relatively recently, um, properly, the places where we lived uh, on that fringe in Irish history. Instead, there was a lot of association with another one of the two, um, Daydan and the old Irish gods, Lou. Well, I wasn't really interested in a male persona at that time. <laughs> I just spent four years steeped in, you know, the Kayak and Bride. So I wasn't really, and I felt curiously cast adrift, absolutely, completely cast adrift. I really, I, it stopped me feeling as if I belonged there because it had just been so fundamental to my life in a very, very kind of peculiar sounding way, I suppose. And so I really didn't know what to do. And I, I tried all kinds of things. I d you know, I loved the place. I did belong in a sense, but there was always this sense of something profound lacking. And so um, I just got on with it for a while. In the house where we lived, be at the back of us, there was a heronry, um, a, a little wood where a lot of herons um, laid their um, and made their nests and laid eggs. And, you know, when you live with a creature like that, we lived on a river bank. Every time I walked, everywhere I walked, there were herons. There were herons crying. And of course, they, in those situations, you know, the creatures not only inhabit your daily lives, but they, they enter into your dreams as well. And there was this constant heron imagery in my life. And so I started to, I didn't really actually very, know very much about herons. So I started to look into the imagery of herons and found, lo and behold, that they were associated with longevity. And in lots of Irish and, and Welsh stories too, they were associated with hags. Um, they were very, um, they were very curious, but heron and crane in Irish mythology, by the way, are interchangeable because when the crane died out, the Eurasian crane died out in Ireland, the heron arrived, the grey heron arrived and basically fulfilled its ecological niche. So the Irish word cord is, um, is a word both for heron and for crane. So if I start talking about cranes sometimes and herons, that's why. And so um, that started to make a little bit of sense to me. And one morning I was walking down the riverbank uh, with the dogs very, very early and there was a heron standing on a stone in the middle of the river and it saw us. We obviously frightened the life out of the poor thing. It took off and as it took off it shrieked and it sounded for all the world like a hag's call. And at that moment into my head popped a new character and I called her Old Crane Woman. And I'll come back to her in a moment but I use this to illustrate the ways in which the land kind of um, makes itself available to you, the images make themselves available to you, if you are listening, if your mythic imagination is activated, if you're looking for images, if you're looking for archetypes, if you're looking for creatures to associate yourself with. If you are walking that land like I was every day, and by this time about a year had passed, I'd been there for a while, so my imagination was always looking around for you know, the particular archetypal creatures, the particular stories that I could see. My mythic imagination is pretty well trained because I'm always you know, reading stories, I'm always thinking about myths, I'm always wondering what the mythology is of the hare, what the mythology is of the fox and so on. And so that was my bridge of belonging. That moment where you know, out, literally out of the land came the archetype. Now you can say it came out of my head, if you like, but I'll probably fight with you because I think actually it's more an act of co-creation. I think these things are born, that was born out of my relationship with that place. It couldn't have happened anywhere. There wasn't a heron. It probably couldn't have happened if I wasn't you know, out there looking for it, if I hadn't spent so much time in that place. And that is why I think the mythic imagination and exercising it in every way possible is really very important. Now, I'm telling you this because, um, well, let me step back a bit. If any of you have read um, Leslie Marmon Silco's wonderful novel, Ceremony, she's a Native American writer, and it's a very beautiful novel. If you haven't read it, read it. It's very fine. She has in there an old medicine man called Bettany, who is trying to teach um, his tribe about the value of ceremonies. And ceremonies and stories are kind of interchangeable in the novel. And what he says is that if, if ceremonies don't change, if stories don't change, then, then they become stagnant and they begin to fail. 
So it's not that the old stories necessarily become outdated, it's just that they need to transform themselves sometimes for different times. So I come back to the, the point that I made at the beginning here, which is that every now and again, the stories need to grow and evolve with us as we grow. You know, we need to, we need to catch up. The kayak is very, very powerful as she is, but it's good to find new forms that are relevant to us today in our places today. And that's the kind of um, role that I believe that the mythic imagination can play when these new characters seem to arise out of the land from old archetypes. So kind of like, a, you know, a Kalyuk for the times in a sense, old crane woman <coughs> for me. And in that way, the stories keep on evolving because myth never stops. Okay, we have this impression sometimes, don't we, that it's old, that, it's, uh, that myth is always old, and that's it, then it's done, it's fixed, it stops. And I'm with the medicine man, Bethany. I don't think that that's healthy. I think the old stories are always relevant, but they're particularly well relevant when new ones and new relevant ones grow out of them. I'm not one of these people who thinks that new stories for the times, as so many people seem to be calling for now, should come out of our heads. I don't believe that. I don't believe we should make up the stories. I don't think that's a good thing. The stories come out of the old stories, which are the stories of the land. And in our relationship with the land, our looking for them, up come these new forms. And so the stories never get stuck. The mythology never stops. It grows with us. We are myth makers, as Carl Jung said. Well, we're myth co-creators, I suppose I would say. We never, ever stop making myth. Um, and yeah, I think it's really important that the myths carry on and grow with us. So what I'd like to do is I want to leave time for questions because I think that's really important. But what I'd like to do, and for discussion, or to the point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to leave the last words um, with old Crane Woman. Because at the time that I, I um, found that character, it was as if some strange half heron, half woman had kind of like possessed me completely. And I started to write um, odd fragments on my blog. It was kind of like a Celtic equivalent of the Greek Halcyon Nights, which were the days either side of winter solstice, and they called them after the Halcyon, um, because often they were apparently, um, the, w the weather was unusually warm then or something. And I created Grey Heron Nights, which was kind of my um, place-bound antidote to them and wrote quite a lot. And Old Crane Woman had a very um, distinct um, voice to me. And also I could see her, she was half woman, half crane, so her arms were kind of like out at funny pointy angles and she always was standing on one leg and, um, and she was a haunter of the, of the river banks, of course, you might see her there on a dark night if you were careful enough and crept down. Um, and this is just one of the fragments that I wrote. Old crane woman is thinking, sitting on her nest, thinking, thinking. What is she thinking about? She's thinking about beauty. Beauty, you laugh, old crane woman. And old crane woman hears you, yes she does. See how sharply she turns her head? You think she's ugly then, that old crane woman, with her sagging skin and knobbly knees and her hair all matted and tattered and gray. You think you know what beauty is. The blandness of youthful skin, the softness of plump young flesh, the innocence of bright young eyes. You go right on there then. You go and ask old crane woman. Ask old crane woman about beauty and she'll laugh out loud. Can you hear old crane woman laugh? You want to know what beauty is, boy? Look over there now. Look at old crane woman. See how she rises there from her nest, stretching out her bony old arms, arching up her long thin neck. See how she stands, how still, how still. See how her skin shines in the starlight, skin that's thin, transparent, and worn. You want to know what beauty is, boy? Look again at old crane woman. Listen to old crane woman's cracked, croaking song. Beauty is a body bowed from the weight of a life fully lived. Beauty is hair bleached in the light of a life fully loved. Beauty is the angular, bony edges of a life fully risked. Look into old crane woman's cavernous black eyes and you'll learn a thing or two about beauty. Listen to old crane woman's song, you'll learn a thing or two about beauty. Listen to old crane woman laugh in the long cold dark, listen to her weep in the fragile light of dawn, listen to her joy in the pain of giving birth. Are you learning now about beauty? Do you think she cares what you think? You think she cares, old crane woman? Old crane woman is hatching an egg. She's the watcher in the dark, the keeper of the tales. 
She's the guardian of the gate, the crystal in the cave. Old crane woman was here before you, and she'll be here after you. You pay your respects. Thank you. So, who has a question or a comment? We, I don't think we've got a microphone to pass around, so you'll have to shout if you do, and then we'll see. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I think you know, we hear time and time again these days calls for new stories, like you know the old stories, stories of our civilization, which are based on progress, growth, patriarchy, and what have you, are broken. Therefore, we need new ones. I don't believe you can actually change the world by sitting in a room making up stories. Okay, sitting in a room making up stories for books, for fiction, yes, absolutely, you know, changing the world in a different way. But stories don't just, the stories of the kind that I'm talking about, which are kind of like mythical stories, which, and myths give meaning to life. Okay, myths are, myths are stories which tell us how the world is. Okay, how the world really is. They usually are a little, they have a little bit of cosmology in them, they have a little bit of moral in them. It's like how, how, uh, it's really, uh, the, they represent the values that you live by, I suppose. And I don't believe, generally speaking, that the myths that capture our imagination and carry on through the centuries and live and resonate and change lives ever come out of us just sitting down and making them up. I think that they emerge organically um, from, um, from living. And I think particularly they emerge organically from relationship with the land. To me, the land is absolutely important and fundamental. And um, I don't know how it isn't for most people because it's the ground of our being. Okay, it's where our feet are. Um, it's what gives us the air that we breathe. It's what we give. We give all of ourselves back into it in the end. And we live so much inside our heads that we've forgotten how to be with the land. And that's why I think the mythic imagination is a good bridge to bring us back to the land. But the point is that these old stories originally would have sprang from people's relationship with the land. Clearly, the old Celtic stories did. They sprang from their sense of balance and harmony and living in, you know, the idea that if you took too much, it wouldn't be there anymore and you'd be screwed. Um, we seem to have forgotten that today. So what I'm suggesting is that if those stories change for the times, because we are different now, we, you know, we have some different ways of living, that they also emerge from, from, uh, from our relationships with our places, that they don't come out of our heads like these characters. Old Crane Woman didn't come out of my head. She came out of a heron. Uh, you know, she came out of me walking every day with the land, um, and those are the stories. And it's the same, absolutely the same in, in cities. The kind of like urban myths that arise these days are, uh, arise in exactly the same way. They generally don't occur from somebody sitting and making them up. You know, they it just... It sounds like more of an embodied experience, but the body can be different. I mean, there might be a person who can't walk the land and sits captain, and he can still have a myth-making power. Because it's very difficult to qualify what comes from the mind and what's an embodied experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't think so because we all have an embodied experience in the world, okay, just by being here, it's just that we don't tend to really focus on our relationship with the land and our embodiment in the land and our complete sensory uh, immersion in the land. We, we, we have bought into that old uh, Western philosophy that, that um, it is our heads, you know, it's what's inside our heads. Um, that, that mediates our relationship with the world when it's not. It's our body, it's what we see, it's what we smell, it's what we hear, it's what we touch. So we are completely embodied whether we can like, recognise it or not. So what I'm trying to suggest is not that people have to stride through the land waiting for myths to occur, but just be outside, okay? You, anybody can do that. Um, it, it just, Sit in the same place for 10 minutes every day in all seasons, in all weathers, and you'll find old crane woman or her equivalent because that's how you start to listen to the land. That's what I call falling into the land's dreaming. It's you become a part of it. Um, you see the patterns that are normal around you. 
you begin to understand what's not a normal pattern and what might be kind of like interesting, you know, something to, to look out at. And you begin to, to, to develop a relationship. So, so say, you, say you're in a place with lots of crows, you know, then by seeing the crows, by, by watching the crows, by listening to the crows, observing their behavior, then all of a sudden characters that are crows kind of like start to pop into your head. You know, the mythical crow seems to make more sense. I kind of wanted to develop from that, you, when you said, I, I think maybe we're on the same flex, that the kayak doesn't live in London. Mm -hmm. Some people cannot physically embody a landscape, or they are only embodying a very specific landscape that might be an electric night or a city, or they might literally be in prison. Mm -hmm. I still think that this, the mythic imagination has a place for them and is important, so I wanted to kind of, I feel like the kayak definitely does live in London, or that's an archetype that I would see here a lot. That's it. So I just wanted to ask what you meant by that. Okay, it's an archetype that you see here a lot. Okay, the kayak herself is very much the, the rocks and stones of particular parts of the land, but that's what I was trying to, to get across at the beginning. The old woman of the world archetype, the, the old woman of the archetype is absolutely everywhere. So I'm, I'm constantly um, uh, talking to people, for, for example, in America and other places where the, their ancestry is Irish and Scottish, and they want to find the kayak, say, in the New Mexican desert. Well, she's here, but you'll find an old woman of some kind in the New Mexican desert if you go there and you sit there and you wait for her to emerge, just as I had to go to my riverbank in Donegal where she wasn't and wait for her to emerge in a different kind of like... Um, um, vision of that archetype, if that makes sense. So I think the embodied experience is, it, it doesn't really matter where you are. It doesn't really matter where you are. Uh, I think it's absolutely just as possible in the city. Um, so when I say the land, I, I suppose what I'm really talking about is, is the ground beneath your feet, whatever that is, whether it's concrete or even indoors if you're imprisoned, yeah. I think it absolutely comes into play. Somebody in the, in the workshop, um, uh, I can't remember who it was now, if I could point you out, if, um, if I could see you, but I can't, uh, wrote a very fine piece from London uh, where you had a fox woman. Who was that? Who was that? Was it you? Okay, yeah, um, see, seeing, yeah, that's right, seeing your, your particular London estate, um, uh, we were talking about, you know, the, the characteristics of a place, the personality of a place, and you saw it as an old woman who had a fox in the heart. There you go, in Dol Dalston? Well, it's Stolich, I only it began with a T. <laughs> so, you know, th this is what I'm saying. The, the, the old woman archetypes come up, and that was without being prompted. So the old woman archetypes come up, and, and they're specific to the place, and they're specific with the relationship that you have with your place, if that makes sense. Yeah. I suppose I'm, I'm bouncing several different things in my head at the same time. Um, I'm not managing it very well. I, 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 I watched a, a Heron a year or two back down in Devon. Um, I see him sometimes down when I go down there, and I watched him or her for a long time. Um, and, and then a few months later, I, I, I don't write poetry very often, but I wanted to write a poem about it. But, but the Heron was a male to me, and of course, you know, I might be me projecting myself onto the Heron, etc., etc. So I'm sort of trying to balance what we, as a, as a being, project out yeah. onto things and what these, in the sense that you talk about myth, you know, it's kind of, uh, was I not open to something, or was I, you know, uh, it, it, how you would see it, as to what was going on there for me, perhaps? Um, I, I don't think it matters at all. I mean, clearly there are, um, there are male herons, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all right. Um, <laughs> I'm not being facetious. No, I didn't, because I suppose most of my focus on the Celtic mythology, at least up until now, has been on the, on the female um, persons because I find them a bit more interesting. Really, I do, because often in Celtic mythology, with a couple of exceptions, um, they tend to be very heroic, and I kind of like, like to think that we're moving beyond that. But when I moved to Donegal, as I said, that was the kingdom of Lou. Okay, now I wasn't having any of that. Um, but when I started to look, once I'd found my Kayach, I was all right then, and I went and I looked at Lou and what Lou was as a male figure in Celtic mythology. It was quite an interesting one. I'm not going to bore you here because we'll go on forever. So I think it, the, the point is that there isn't any right thing. You know, Heron in, in um, Celtic mythology almost always is associated with female, female shape-shifting particularly, probably because she's very tall and very thin and kind of like, you know, very, very kind of like quiet as opposed to r rushing around. And so I always think of herons as female myself. But if I were a male, I'm sure I'd, I'd, you know, I'd be looking at it differently. And why wouldn't I? Because your mythic, what you make, what you co-create with the land as a male is going to be different from what I co-create, chances are. So it's whatever comes to you. There's no right or wrong. It's not like, you know, Heron is old crane woman. Heron, for me, in that place is old crane woman. For somebody else, it might be something different. What's interesting where we, we're, 
but the fact to make in a sense is, is, is I saw the heroin as doing lots of thinking too. Mm -hmm. But deeply in the past, I'm not sure about the future, but I saw the heroin as deeply thinking about the past actually. It's interesting that you perhaps saw something yeah, and, and you know, the heron is, a, is an icon in um, Celtic, uh, what we do know about um, Celtic practice was, was very important, or rather the crane in those days. And so um, the, um, the bards, or the filly, the filly, sorry, yeah, the poets um, would, if they wanted to curse someone, stand, um, they'd adopt a heron stance. So they'd stand on one leg with their, out like that. And, and the, it was believed that the crane, um, or the heron, um, had a power over words or associated with words so that if you took that pose of the heron you know you you were absolutely um uh, your words were going to change things and they were mostly men so it wasn't just that the heron was a female character yeah hi um i'm really grateful for what you were saying about um the ceremonies and stories don't change then they become stagnant and uh, start to fail and that we need to find new forms that will always stay fresh to new forms that are relevant to the time. Um, I work in the field of um, wilderness rites of passage. Um, and one of the challenges that we have, even though the field of wilderness rites of passage is a contemporary form, so people may go out and spend solo time um, on the land, um, and they return often having had a very powerful experience and that really roots them in the land, our main challenge is the, the phase of incorporation when they come back to, the, to their normal life. Uh, we can't support them in that, and they are very, you know, it's, I've met people who've had very painful experiences of that. Um, and as you're speaking, I'm wondering if one of the kind of the tools perhaps that could support the form, I mean, I need to think about this more, <coughs> is this, uh, what did you call the imaginalis? The Mundus imaginalis. Yes. Mm -hmm that um, perhaps that could help as a bridge. And perhaps it's things like this with people coming together and um, allowing for the sharing of that kind of language that might help people return. Because that's a big challenge, um, not something that individual guides <coughs> can really bring about. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that, um, or just for me to say thank you for bringing that up, and then I'm going to mull on it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's a really it's a really interesting point because I think often what people bring back from from um, these kind of rites of passage experience, particularly in the wilderness, is a very iconic um, bird or animal or something that they feel has in some sense been with them, and don't necessarily know what what you know what to make of that or what to do with it, yeah. and think that they mustn't. Um, so I think it is very important. I just want to say something on the old and the new, though. Um, I I do whenever I'm teaching um, mythology, and I suppose it's from my own background, going back to the as, as an academic going back to the original sources I think it's really important to understand what those original sources were you know because I think I think our ancestors had a lot of wisdom that we don't and they're encoded in those original sources and so they're very interesting I think also they kind of like give us a almost like a map of the archetypal energies that are available to us in the land if I can put it that way you know the, the kinds of creatures that automatically um, are there inhabiting it um, and this morning in my workshop, we were talking about, you know, what archetypal creatures might live in your place, um, depending on the kind of personality of the place and the flora and fauna that are there and the landscapes that are there. Um, and I think that's kind of like, so they give us some guidance. So I like the fact that I saw something new in a heron, which is an old, old creature that has all of this, you know, history behind it, because it's almost like it, it just makes me feel that it, was, that it was kind of like more real rather than just like made up, because clearly these are creatures um, that, have, that have been occupying that Mundus Imaginalis, if we want to call it that, in Ireland for an awfully long time. So the old sources, knowing them is really important, but also the ability to break out of them authentically, I think is a really good thing to cultivate, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How do you suggest that in the place like London where there's so many people who've moved here from different places, from countries that bring with them their own culture and their own stories. How do they integrate with the land and how you know, is there a balance that you can find with people bringing new stories from other places <coughs> as well as finding the old myths from you know, from here, from England or yeah, actually, I think it's a great way of integrating, to be honest, and I wish more was done on that. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about exactly this, in the context more of fo folklore, perhaps, than mythology. Folklore tending to be, well, arguably degraded, kind of like mythology, you know. Um, 
uh, when it's become a little bit, um, well, the, yeah, it's, uh, it's added on various elements. But the, the point there is that, you know, so many of these folk tales um, have motifs and characters and ideas that are absolutely international. You know, you see, you're always seeing an old woman of the world, as I said, or some equivalent of it. You're always seeing, um, you know, heroes slaying dragons, going off on quests. Um, you're all, all of the classic motifs from fairy stories and folk, folk tales appear all over the world. What's interesting is how we dress them up in individual places. Um, but but it, to me, they, they show more about um, our similarities and our differences. And, and if and, and yet, you know, kind of like teach us to embrace the diversity and the various different ways in which we interpret those motifs. So I kind of wish that more was done with, with people moving in, particularly now with asylum seekers and, and refugees who find it very difficult to integrate. Actually, that is, to me, that's one way in, you know, to actually look at the motifs and say, no, we've got one of them as well, but, you know, here's what he's called and here's what he does. Um, so I don't find it a problem at all. Stories have always travelled um, in, in, in one, you know, significant sense. Um, but it's. But I think it's. I do think though, if you are moving into a place, yes, it's good to know what their version of the old woman of the world is, because that's. You know, those are the. Those are the archetypes that are inhabiting that land. If that makes sense. Yes. Um, I think I've got a feel for what uh, talking about how connecting with the myth is a benefit to you in terms of belonging, and it's a benefit to all of us as individuals. I can see that. Do you feel that there are collective gifts, either to people or the land, when we do that individually? Are, are there collective what? <coughs> gifts? Goodness, something. Um, I, I think I think that one of the reasons why. Um, okay, can I, I, I just want to answer it not not a long way, but coming at it from a slightly different angle. Um, again, sorry for the people in the workshop for repeating something I said earlier on. I think when I moved from Scotland to Ireland. Uh, the west of Ireland, where I had lived before. Even though the landscape looks very, very similar in the two places I had been, the, the feel of it is very, very different. It is very much more, it's as if the land in Ireland is softer and very much more engaged still with humans. And the reason for that is everybody walks with one foot in the, the other world, other than this imaginalis, you know? It's, this is as natural as breathing. To, to, to bring a raven, a, a gift as a, of a raven's feather, as my very crusty um, old neighbour did once in Donegal because he thought that I had a thing about ravens and there was some mythical thing and there might even have been a fairy in it. He didn't know, but he'd bring me a raven feather anyway and kind of <laughs> run away. You know, it's just like everybody, everybody has a belief in otherworldly somethings. Um, it's perfectly natural. And so, yes, I do. So that's my way of saying, yes, I do, that if we engage with the land, then it's more open to us. Whereas in Lewis, where I lived, People hadn't done that for generations in the place where I lived, and the church up there particularly had turned them, taught them to turn away from that, literally to turn their backs on the land so that their windows had not to be facing the sea because, boy, that would get you every time. Uh, and, and also, you know, not to love the music, not to allow musical instruments, not to tell the old stories. And so it's almost as if the land had just sat back and thought, well, buggy you then. And so when I went there, kind of like all open-eyed and kind of like, you know, I found it very, very hard going. And then, I, then it was a very intense relationship. You move to Ireland and it, 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 everywhere, it's easy. So yes, I think it is really important for the whole collective for us to be engaged with the land. It's just the whole place opens up. Yeah. Are we done? Yes, I'm sorry, we're done. Thank you very much for the <laughs> <laughs>